Well, good Monday morning to you. It's another week we're starting. It's Monday, April the 19th, and looking forward to this week in some ways. Other ways, it's going to be a, a pretty grueling week for the Oliver household. Uh, my daughter Sarah and my wife Sandy are involved in a play that uh, actually is going to be performed here at First Conyers. I'll give you those times and dates tomorrow, um, but it's uh, through the uh, co-op, the homeschool co-op, where my daughter is an administrator and teaches. And so a lot of our kids here at First Conyers are involved in the play, so uh, you want to come out and support them in it. Uh, but then also, uh, pray for me, I've got a major, major, major paper due uh, Sunday, and so I'll be working on that. Amber, I know you and Alan are anticipating that new baby, and we're praying for you. Uh, looking forward to seeing pictures. Um, this morning I was taking some time in one of my old, I call them my antique hymnals. Uh, I have a number of hymnals that are dated back um, 18th century, 19th century, somewhere in there. And I came across a song, uh, a hymn, that's an old hymn, I'd never heard it before. And as I read and meditated on the words of the hymn, I thought, man, how appropriate that is for what we are looking at in the book of Galatians. And the title of this, this hymn is called Here is Love. Some of you may know it. It wasn't familiar to me in the tradition I grew up in. It was written in 1876 by a gentleman by the name of William Reese. He was a part of the Welsh Bible Union. And so um, somewhere along in, in the lines in there, it got dropped from the Baptist hymnal, I suppose. And uh, But it has been rekindled as of late, uh, I've learned in the in this century and so an old becoming new and I love that um, songs never um, it's interesting to watch songs how they revive themselves over time and some go away some come back uh, but this is a, this is a good old hymn and just meditate if you don't know the hymn you can't sing along just listen to the words of this this hymn and I think it'll be a blessing to you here is love, fast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the priests of life for ransom shed for us his precious blood, who his love. Now 
Thou dost direct me by Thy Spirit through the Word, and Thy grace my need is meeting as I try. song. Um, if you knew that hymn, just give me a thumbs up. I just want to know how many people were familiar with that hymn. Um, I love it. I'm going to have to see if Zach can learn that and do it one Sunday morning. Uh, today we're looking at Galatians chapter 2, picking up in verse uh, 15. And if we remember, uh, Paul is making the case in Galatians that that we are saved by faith alone. And these Galatians uh, were being infiltrated by other false teachers who were adding to their salvation experience through faith alone and saying that you've got to adhere to the law in, in, uh, in addition to faith. And particularly in circumcision and other manners uh, relating to um, the Sabbath, etc., and here we come to verse 15, and he says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Making the case that, listen, even though we ourselves are Jews, we recognize that through the, the, through the presentation, the revelation, progressive revelation towards the gospel, that Christ provided a way for salvation through Christ and Christ alone. And so he's saying, we're, 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 we're Jews by birth uh, and not Gentile sinners. Yet, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Three times Paul makes that repeated phrase, justification by faith. It's, it's the hallmark of the Protestant Reformation that, that um, Martin Luther nailed those, that creed on the, on, the, on the door and stating that we are justified by faith alone in Christ. And, and this really predates the gospel because Abraham himself, Abram, the father of the Jews, it stated numerous times throughout Scripture that Abram, Abraham was justified by faith. He was not justified by his works. Now, this, this term justified, this, this just really, there's so much wrapped up in that one word that, that man, just should, should cause your heart to say, God, thank you so much for, for my salvation. We know without doubt that we all stand before God apart from Christ as sinners, and we are condemned as sinners. Um, there's absolutely nothing that we can do to cleanse ourselves of our wretched sin, not only our sinful acts, but our sinful nature, the way we are. We are all born in Adam, born sinners. And as a consequence of our sin, we know that there is a punishment that has to be meted out. The wrath of God uh, has to has to be because God is a just God, and God has to punish the sinner. And here in Christ, Paul is stating that we are justified, meaning that that when we're justified in Christ, that He has given us remission from the penalty of our sin. 
And we know ultimately the penalty of our sin, while we do bear out consequences in this life of our sin, the, the, the end is the penalty of sin is eternal death, the second death that John speaks of in Revelation, that those who are not in Christ will face an eternal death separated from God in hell. And so God, because he is just, again, he has to punish sin. Now here in this word justification, it, it's, a, it's a legal decree that God has made, if you will. He's the judge, and he has decreed you and I to be, uh, to be absolved from the penalty of our sin, which is death. The second thing that God does in that act of justification is he, he, can't, he can't just wipe away our sin because it's there. But in our justification, number one, he has absolved us of the penalty of that sin, and he's restored us in favor with himself. It, it'd be kind of like uh, if, if I were convicted or if I were going to trial for a capital or federal offense, that the judge could determine there as I stood before him that, that I don't have to face the penalty that the law requires uh, for me to face in incarceration or the death penalty, whatever it might be, that the judge would absolve me of all of that penalty. But going further than that, he would not only just relinquish me from the penalty of that crime that I might have committed, but, but it restores me back into favor. Um, it might be that we would compare that to our judicial system where a person is re is not only reprieved, but he's given a full remission, and that crime is no longer on the record. He's restored with every right that he would have had as a citizen that that federal offense may have prevented him from having. And so when God's justified us in Christ, he's absolved us from the penalty of that. He's restored us back into favor with him, and in that act of justification, it goes further than that. He has placed on us the righteousness of Christ. He has imputed Christ's righteousness to us. Now, it's not in the way that God is righteous or holy in the sense that that's his nature, that's his being. Uh, we are not divine, but God has imputed onto us the righteousness of Christ. Some have defined justification like this that God sees you and I as we are in Christ just as if we'd never sinned. That is a hard one to wrap our minds around because daily we're reminded that, that we are sinners. We, we still sin even though that we have been saved. But when God sees us, he doesn't see us as sinners. He sees us as the righteousness of God in Christ. He sees Christ's righteousness. It just makes my heart full every time I think about it. This doctrine of justification never gets old, that God has, has, um, has wiped away the penalty of my sin, that God in Christ has restored me in favor with him in Christ, and I'm in relationship with him, and that God has imputed, transferred the righteousness of Christ to you and to me. That's something to praise the Lord about. He goes on to say in verse 17, but if in our endeavor to be justified or our, in, in our, our life in justification in Christ, we are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. What Paul is saying here, listen, we recognize the same thing he says in Romans chapter 6, 1. Uh, that even though we know that we've been justified, we're in Christ, we've been justified by faith alone, we still find that we do sin. Is that meaning that Christ is a proponent of sin? He's saying absolutely not. Uh, Paul says in Romans, for where grace abound, uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. We're not to take advantage of the grace of God and say, well, God's going to forgive me anyway, so let me go ahead and go sin. No, that's not what Paul, that's not the case that he's making. But he's making that, that the more we recognize how sinful we are, the more grace, the more the grace of God abounds. My goodness. If you look at me this morning and you see fault, and it's there, 
um, be careful that, that you don't judge. Or if I look at you and I see fault, I need to be careful that I don't judge because the same grace of God that has put you and me in right position is the same grace of God that carries you and I in the Christian life. Thank God that we can admit that we are sinful, rotten sinners. And we all acknowledge that before God. But thank God for the grace of Christ that has been poured out on us in abundant measure that we can never fully fathom. He goes on to say this, For if I rebuild what I tore down, that is, he's talking about the law. If I try to rebuild what, what's been torn down, the law has been has been torn. The law hasn't vanished. It's still there. But all of the law, all of the requirements of the law have been fulfilled in Christ. I prove myself to be a transgressor. Then he says in verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Paul goes on to explain in the book of Romans that the law was given to show the righteous requirements of God for you and I to have relationship to him. And through the law, it should become evident to every one of us that there's no way that we can uphold the law of God. And if we violate one portion, if, if you and I might say, well, you know, I've, I've held to the law of God except for this one little thing. Paul says, if we violate any requirement in the law, we are guilty of violating the whole law. So what, what's the case? We stand before God as sinners, not measuring up to his righteous requirements, but through the blood of Jesus. When we trust him and accept him by faith, we are made the righteousness of God in Christ. We are justified. Then he goes on to tell us in verse 20 and verse 21. This is one of my life verses. I love it um, because there's so much in it. Um, Having, having recognized that we've been saved by Christ, now we're to live our life in him and in that position. And it's really not our life that we live anymore. It's Christ living his life through us. It, it's, it's impossible for you and I to live the Christian life. That may be startling to some of you. But it's impossible on our own to live the Christian life. But it's Christ living his life through us and empowering us. We can live the Christian life. Does that make sense? In other words, it doesn't depend on me. It doesn't depend on you to live the Christian life. It's Christ living his life through us. We simply yield. We consider ourselves dead. We reckon ourselves to be dead to the flesh, dead to that sin nature, and allow Christ to live his life through us. Verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And you and I can put our name in that, in that blank. J-Mo has been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it's, it's no longer I who live. But the life that I live in this body, the life I live out, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we, we live this life. In Christ, it's no longer I who live, Paul says, but it's Christ who lives in me, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify, I don't discount the grace of God, he says in verse 21. For if, if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Today in closing, man, just thank God when we stop, when we end the video, just thank God for his gracious, loving, merciful gift in Christ Jesus. Thank God this morning that he gave an opportunity that you might hear the gospel. And he gave you the faith to trust what Christ has done. And he's made you a new creation in Christ. Stop trying to live the Christian life on your own. Yield and allow Christ to live his life through you. That's what we mean when we say we walk by grace. Boy, what a great salvation. Pray that God gives you an opportunity today to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart. 
uh, that they too might hear that great news that you heard. Share with them your story, how God saved you, and now he's transformed your life, and you have a hope of eternity. If you recognize that somebody's already had a seed planted in their heart, pray and ask God by the Holy Spirit to empower you, to enable you to be able to cultivate that seed. And if God would so bless us by allowing us to see somebody, witness somebody, be saved by him today. Wouldn't that be glorious? I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you, that he keep you. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Have a great day.